Texts in the City brings classic texts to life for students, teachers, and lifelong learners. This time, we're taking on Ray Lawler's classic novel, Summer of the Seventeenth Doll. Because, you know, we hear a lot about whether or not playwrights can write roles for women, whether or not theatre and film people can project women into the world truthfully. And Ray created these four extraordinary women of different ages and uh, outlooks it seems effortlessly, you know, they play, they sing off the page. And that, to me, seems almost the most significant um, achievement, I mm. think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, place and time. Mm. Um, the the play is set in the 50s, in 1953. Um, and... Australia in 1953 is obviously an incredibly different Australia to the Australia we have now. It was sort of a great time of change. It was, you know, um, after the Second World War and sort of just as the Cold War was sort of starting to really kick in. So I think there was a lot of fear, but it was also the beginning of a time of great prosperity for Australia. And so I think Australia uh, was sort of coming out of, a, of one period and entering into another. Um, how consciously do you think the play reflects what Australia was then and what it was sort of turning into? I think it's a very particular representation because, of course, these are working-class people and the play doesn't, uh, doesn't actually depict one truth about the cane-cutting world, which, which is actually presented in another beautiful Australian play called Too Young for Ghosts by Janis Balotis, which is that most of the cane-cutters were, in fact, migrants. They were people who'd come from Europe after the war as displaced persons, as they were called then. And um, so in that respect, I think it's quite interesting because it's very white, which Australia mostly mm. still was. Um, but other than that, you know, the, the, the notion that a woman would go into a lounge bar, you know, to have a drink and all those kind of wonderful background things uh, about that world are beautifully represented. And the morals of the world are just ever so gently placed before us through pearls, sort of dis, you know, dismay about what happens in this house. Mm -hmm. and Because it is a very free and easy house. It's mm. a very unusual house, mm. really, for, for that period. The notion of these guys coming and living in sin for five months of yeah. the year, that, they were radical, you know. So there are many things about it that are very typical of the 50s, but it's actually a quite uh, unusual mm. sort of... Uh, representation. Uh, radical, I would say, for the time mm. to present those. And I think that a lot of the people who were nice Melbourne Theatre Company goers at the time would have found that representation of Australia slightly kind of confronting. And, and let's talk about that house, because it is an incredible house. Um, and I think the thing that struck me the most about uh, when I read it as a teenager was that you know, I was so used to reading plays, you know, by Shakespeare and by Chekhov that were all sort of set in places that were so far away and so long ago that they may as well have been imaginary. But this play is set in Carlton, which is five minutes from here. And the, there was there is an incredible sort of familiarity in sort of the description of the house. You know, those terrace houses are all still there and um, a lot of them, I suspect, are still quite similar on the inside. But then the Carlton of this play and the Carlton that's there now, which is full of, of rich people, students and recent migrants, it's a very different Carlton. How do we, how do we deal with that, sort of, with that sort of recognition but also unfamiliarity? Well, I think the, the actual setting of the play is a character in the play. I mean, I think it's the next character but after the people. And... You know, Ray's description of it at the beginning is so beautiful that you can kind of smell the mosquitoes in the fernery, you know, or hear them. You don't smell them, you hear them. Um, but it is fascinating because I, I feel that there are certain places on earth that I want to go to because I've encountered them through literature. And Melbourne for me was Helen Garner's city and Aqua Profonda, but it was also Young and Jackson's and Carlton. And so going to Carlton, even in the late 70s when I first came, and it was a very exciting place then, but it was hard to find Ray's Carlton. But the interesting thing about it is if you, if you read the play, that will always exist for you. Ray's Carlton, mm. that Carlton will always exist. And I mean, I think it's the tribal nature of Melbourne too. You know, he, he's, because he sets it so specifically in that place, it means something quite specific too. Mm. So I think that for a lot of people, seeing this on stage, hearing Young and Jacksons and all those, you know, those familiar names, 
it would have been a real jolt to think, wow, we can see ourselves up there. Um, and sh sh then, then to think, are we worthy of seeing ourselves up there? Do we deserve to see ourselves? And then, of course, for the nice middle class people to think, well, why isn't it a nice middle class play and mm -hmm. not, a, not about these working class people? Yeah. So we get everything now. We just get everything. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was quite a different time. Yeah. Mm. Um, so let's, while we're sort of talking about the period of it, I want to talk a lot about the language uh, in the play because it is very Australian. It has this sort of incredibly thick and broad Australian vernacular. Uh, you were saying before in the green room that some of that has been changed. As you would have read if you've read the preface of this version, Ray has changed it quite recently. He ch in fact, he made big changes for this production. Um, and some of those are about the vernacular, and I miss some of them. There's one that I particularly miss, which is early on when Emma arrives and she's carried in by Barney, and and she she says at one point, oh, you know, you only just gave me a couple of notes in this version. And that was originally a couple of a couple of fiddlies. Now fiddlies comes from rhyming slang, which was fiddly did, which was quid and quid related to what we called pounds, which is what the currency was then. And part of me really misses that because I think, well, to put a couple of notes just for the sake of clarity, and I do understand clarity, but it misses, you know, I miss the music of fiddlies. And so those sorts of compromises are really interesting when you start to look between the two. But even words like snazzy that Olive uses, I mean, we don't hear snazzy very much anymore, maybe some people snazzy do. Snazzy all the snazzy's time. Snazzy's really good, isn't I it? I love snazzy. You know, the, the kind of density of the language mm. is very beautiful in a particular music. But interestingly, that broad Australian accent, when you come to direct young people, which I do down at VCA or over at WAPA, they can't do that accent anymore. It's harder for them to create that broad working class Australian accent than it is for them to do any number of American uh, dialects because that's what's in the ear mm. all the time. And yeah, that particular accent, and, but also music and use of language is, is disappearing. And what's the equivalent of that? I mean, if Ray were to want to give us the modern equivalent, it might well be the word a couple of bucks. Well, bucks is borrowing from American, you know, so we borrow our mm. music from a different culture now too. Mm. So uh, one of the sort of the biggest differences, I suppose, between the 1950s and now is, is sort of the, the gender roles and the way that we perceive each gender. And I think that the, um, the play is sort of happens at this really crucial time for masculinity. It happens at this real kind of transitional period from when men were these sort of rugged, bronzed, outdoor warriors um, who, you know, would go off and you know, kill things and carry them home and, I don't know, work <laughs> outside to a sort of a much more contemporary idea of, of what it means to be a man and a husband and a father, which is to be much more present, uh, like a much more participatory member of a family, um, you know, and there is that great... Um, quote uh when uh, when they're talking about when um i think it's olive is, is sort of describing to pearl uh about what it's like when when these two sort of as she calls them two eagles, eagles fly flying, flying down, down out, of out, of out of the sun um and that the regulars in the pub the sort of the city folk would just stand aside to let them through just as if they were a couple of kings uh and that she reckoned they always made the rest of the mob look like a bunch of skinned rabbits what do you think it is about sort of that changing role uh, in masculinity that kind of that comes out in this? And do you think that do you think that Rue and Barney really are those kind of great bronze eagles, or are they performing that? Oh, look! I mean, in a way, that could go either way with performance. But I think the thing about that that really interests me is. I actually grew up on a sheep station in the northwest of Western Australia, and there is a sense, Ray writes about this in the preface, he talks about the difference between the north and the south. There is a real sense of that thing, and it still exists in our mythology, even if not in reality, of these kings in grass castles, or these men from the north, and the kind of little pale city people in the south. And I actually think that that still exists, even if it doesn't absolutely exists. There is a part of that that lives in our kind of mythology around being Australian, that we kind of want to believe that there are still these kind of men who are men. Um, and so, you know, in a way that's why I think feminism has a really, uh, has had a very interesting road in Australia. And, you know, the fact that Germaine Greer wrote that book, that we do cling to this notion of them. But then the brokenness of them at the end is a really beautiful counterpoint to that, mm. I think, because the notion that that can't live forever, the notion that that kind of maleness actually is at odds with the wish to create a family and all mm. of those things, you know, that 
I mean, the, the dolls, in a way, are their babies, but you think that sort of separation between maleness and femaleness <laughs> can only produce probably dolls. Mm. You know, it can't produce real children, um, that sort of notion of yourself as that male. Yeah. There's got to be something in there that has a tenderness allowable, yeah. you know. Mm. You know, women were expected to quit their jobs once they got married and, and you know, the 50s housewife was this sort of paragon of, of a virtue and both Pearl and Olive are not fulfilling that role, Pearl, by circumstance and Olive by choice. Do you think that they have it better off than the Betty Drapers of the world? Oh, gosh, that's it's so subjective, isn't it? I mean, I, I look at Olive and I think... And I've seen that last scene and directed that last scene so many times where she says, you know, I want what you've taken, give it back to me, give me back what you've taken. And I think that Olive, you know, Olive is made to grow up in a really cruel way because she has every dream she's ever dreamed taken from her. But the dreams are sort of the dreams of a child too, mm. you know, that I, I'm very fascinated by Baba saying in the new version uh, of the play, you know, I've sort of seen what you've got and I know a version of, she says something like, I, I know it won't be like that, or, you know, but I want to give it a go, that Ray seems to have acknowledged that, you know, that Bubba's actually slightly more grown up than Olive was at the same time, mm. uh, that that's what's happening with the passing of time. Or with, I mean, it's very interesting that we never hear a word in the play about Olive's father. Uh, she's ne he's never mentioned and you think so what was the male influence on that woman who's grown up with this kind of notion of the eagle flying south bringing mm. a doll it's a very daddy yeah. um, image you know to, to hold to so one part of me wants Olive to have everything and the other part of me just knows that that's impossible but ironically of course she's actually kind of a feminist in some ways, mm. you know. So, so there's this kind of odd juxtaposition. I mean, that's what's so beautiful about them. They're not stereotypes. Mm. They're three-dimensional and flesh and blood. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Mm. And I feel like she is, in some ways, she's quite masculine because she doesn't want to give up her freedom. You know, she kind of has to make a choice in the end between whether, you know, she wants to become that 50s housewife or at least whatever kind of version of it she would have been with Rue. Um, but in which case she'd have to give up her job and her freedom and, and sort of everything that she has in her life. And that when she makes that choice, she, she picks the freedom, which I think in some ways could, you know, could be seen as quite a masculine choice mm. of, of that independence and not wanting to belong to somebody, um, which is, you know, kind of the great tragedy, yeah. I suppose, of the play. And also her opinions about Nancy. You know, I mean, Nancy is the great looming character in the play that we feel like we know Nancy almost better than, mm. you know... A, anyone else in the play because we hear about her and we long for her so much but you know she's so scathing Olive about the choice that, An that Nancy has made to get married to a man who has a bookshop yeah, for city heaven's man. sake it's know. a skin rabbit if yeah. ever I heard of one <laughs> um, so, so yes marriage for somewhere in her marriage has become this thing that's a, a small thing in, just in the way that coming south is mm. a small thing for the men but you know the other thing about this that's interesting is the fly in fly out culture the parallel to that now that's happening in the mines it seems to me is producing a whole new set of those sort of social engagements that are mm. challenging for families and for women yep. and for the, and for the men who are doing that work mm. and so it's not so distant it's like it's it's come up again um yeah that's very interesting i hadn't thought about it in that context um, but yeah, I imagine, you know, this kind of scenario is probably playing out in mm. lots of particularly, you know, Perth houses. And mm. Mm. do you think that, um, it, you know, Olive tells a lot of stories. She talks about everybody a lot and she talks about, you know, all the past years a lot. And she's obviously got a lot of nostalgia for the previous summers. How truthful do you think her version of events is? I suspect it's quite truthful, actually. I mean, the interesting thing about this play is so much has changed just before. I mean, the thing of, you know, the thing of Nancy having got married is mm. just such a, a, a kind of a puts the kibosh on it so much. There have been other pains. I mean, in the earlier versions, you know, in the, tr the two earlier parts of the trilogy, we certainly see them go through ups and downs. But um, you know, for her, I th for her, I think it's absolutely true. I, you know, the wonderful thing is Emma's always known it was going to come a cropper. Mm. Now, there's a piece of vernacular. Is that still said, <laughs> come a cropper? I don't know. Am I revealing age? Um, <laughs> but, you know, Emma's always known that, that this was going to end. 
Whereas for all of the emotional truth of it, I think, has sustained her, even if... I mean, she's that wonderful thing, that person who gets up in the morning and goes, oh, you beauty, another day. Mm. You know, she's, she's got that sort of optimism about her, which is what is so lovely, but it's also what makes her so broken at mm. the end. Um, so the play ends with, with Bubba and Johnny O'Dowd sort of taking up the roles uh, that Oliver and Rue had previously had. Do you think that this is sort of a sort of ultimately incredibly tragic depiction of how it's just a vicious cycle that's doomed to repeat over and over again? Or do you think that there is hope for change and that, you know, something else might happen? They seem much more grown up to me than I imagine Olive was at the beginning. And Dowd has a kind of a capacity to speak about his emotional life Mm -hmm. that I don't really see in Rue. Mm Rue has no capacity to explain his internal life in the way that Dowd does. Um, And that moment when he says, what's your real name? I mean, I think that's one of the most potent moments Mm. in the play. You know, when she doesn't... It's almost like she hasn't considered her real name in this house ever. And and that Barney afterwards, when he says Kathy, and he says who... And Barney says who? Mm. You know, that no one... There's something about that depiction of those young people that says to me, they may not end up together, but they will deal with each other as real people and Mm. not as a projection, which I think speaks of hope on yeah. some level. Yeah. And perhaps that's something that all of the other characters have been doing to everybody and to themselves as well, that sort of everyone seems to be, uh, you know, in some ways these sort of idealised summer versions of themselves instead of, you know, the whole person, that yeah. you just sort of get the fun part and not any of the real stuff. Yes, it's like they're living five months of Facebook selves. <laughs> you know, it's like they're living yeah. their, their Facebook life for five months and yeah. then actually... I think Dowd and Baba will get to know the real people yeah. somehow, yeah, and then it'll work or not. But mm-hmm. the real person seems to me the thing that gets lost. Actually, the 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 truth of people gets mm. lost a bit in here. Um, so Lawler says that it's a play about alternatives to marriage. Um, do you think that he's suggesting that there is any alternative? Like, do you think that these characters have any other alternative? Gee, I don't know. I, I, mean, I wouldn't want to second guess that because I, I, I happen to know that Ray's been beautifully married for all his life. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, as an alternative, it doesn't seem to me that, that this one... Well, look, it's interesting, you know, because marriage started at a time when people didn't expect to live much beyond 40. So actually 17 years is not a bad stint. Yeah. I mean, 17 years is actually, as I think Olive says, is, is more than a lot of... 17 happy years is more than what a lot of married people get. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. It depends how you define marriage and then how you define happy marriage. But um, I think that certainly what he's not showing us is to grown-up people in their late 30s. Mm. You know, Rue gets a shock that he's ageing, which we all do, but... It's, it's literally like they've never future projected. They have never got out of this moment. Whereas, you know, a, a marriage or I suppose having children forces people to, mm. maybe not necessarily a marriage, but certainly having children forces people to examine the future, mm. I, I think. And so why do you think Olive refuses Rue? Oh, there's a different question for that for every actress who plays it, but having... In your interpretation. Yeah, in my own version. I, I, look, I, I think it's to do with that thing of give me back what you've taken Mm -hmm. that I literally just think Olive wants to stay in if romance isn't the right word you know the dream that that he's taking her dream and and in a way the most insulting thing he can say to her it seems to me is marry me Mm. which is such a kind of wonderful juxtaposition of the dream you know the the dream of the night she's had the night in the white charger for 17 years Mm. or on the white charger I think in the white charger is a 1970s car but anyway um but you know it's it's the thing of the ultimate offense Mm. is is marry me whereas the ultimate dream for most conventional girls Mm. is marry me so and certainly in sort of text you know that's always you know the the punchline to every you know every Jane Austen novel is always you know and then he proposes Mm. and they get married and live happily ever after and yet for her what is supposed to be this sort of joyous moment is yeah you're right she's horrified Mm. and and it's like there's been nothing but that five months for her you know that the other seven months has been negated and so I always have this image as as the olives I've seen leave the stage of actually thinking what's tomorrow for olive how Mm. does she even get out of bed the next day Again, I, I, you know, I just caution that because it's Australia and because it's ours, we have a tendency to see things as, you know, 
maybe a little smaller or not as majestic. This is a majestic tragedy. And I think it should be looked at, at least in part, in the context of the great lineage of tragedy. Because I absolutely think it is a beautifully constructed piece of tragic writing, as well as all the other things that we can look at. And to kind of shy off that is, in a way, to shy off again that thing of, do we as Australians deserve to have tragedies told us about, about mm. us? We still think of them as little people. Yes, they're little people, but they're experiencing very, very big tragic emotions, as big as any Greek tragedy. Mm. You know, this is a dream being shattered before our eyes. And when Rue smashes that doll, which, you know, you read in the stage directions, he smashes the doll. When he smashes that doll at the end of the piano, you know, onto the end of the piano, and it flies apart, it is a rupture to our psyches out in the audience that is right up there with, you know, Phaedra's declaration of the love of her stepson. You know, I mean, it, 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 it does that stuff to us because it's the end of a dream. So I would just opt for, look at it in the lineage of tragedy as well. Because in a way, the, the thing of then and now still makes it about something smaller. Mm. And it's big, you know, it's big. All right, I've got one last quote, which is from Catherine Brisbane, uh, who wrote that it was a play about growing up, locating its meaning firmly as a statement about Australia's national identity. It is about growing up and growing old and failing to grow up. And the study throws into relief not only the failures of a dilapidated Melbourne household, but also the character of a nation. Wow, that's beautiful. Hmm. Um, I suppose, yes, that's interesting. I, I don't know that anyone... Oh, this is too broad a thing, but Stephen Sewell, I guess, is someone who's writing about that in a political way with his plays. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's a beautiful comment about it. And I don't think I have much to add to it except to say, no, really, you know, except to say I think we're still trying to grow up. We're still, and interestingly, we're still grappling with ideas like, you know, asylum seekers and those things. Mm -hmm. Well, that, at that period in time, they were beginning to grapple with that post the you know they were grappling with it post the war but that's yes that's that inability to grow up in spite of all of our technology and stuff is something that i suppose is a personal perspective but i think we're still trying mm. you know?